Um, so, first of all, the nicest thing is being home since I was born in the region. Uh, and it's been really, really nice to see uh, uh, just the amazing growth of entrepreneurial ecosystems here. Last night at dinner when we sat and talked and, and I learned from uh, Martin and Nasir and the whole gang about how you guys are stitching together the entrepreneurial ecosystems all along this part of upstate New York. I gotta tell you, that's not happening everywhere else in the country in the world, so I just wanna pass on my compliments. It is great to see it happening here. Uh, as Martin said, I just came from a opening startup city uh, in Russia. Uh, the Russians decided to open a startup city and try to sponsor entrepreneurship, and uh, then I did events in Morocco and Algeria, so it's just nice to be home and doing this here. So I won't waste time on my background. Martin kind of already did that. Um, uh, but I will say this, I, I've actually been doing, my whole life I've been doing startups. Um, I had a very brief corporate career. Uh, it did not work out well for either of us. Um, uh, I don't think, it turns out corporate America has no respect for my 27 DNA strands of sarcasm. Uh, so I left. Uh, I've been doing startups ever since. We've had two that we sold, uh, two that we took public. We had two that failed. I told somebody the other day, I wish I had just gone to the bank, taken out cash, got two lawn chairs and lighter fluid because at least I would have got some joy out of the money if I made a big barn fire, bonfire and roasted marshmallows. And then two of our companies are still going. Uh, the one that people know most uh, was what we built at Priceline, but keep in mind, Priceline was a scratch startup like a lot of the entrepreneurs in this room. A small group of people uh, without resources, with a crazy idea that today does business in 200 countries and territories and is a $65 billion company. But it was started with nothing from scratch. I think that's the most important message like so many others. Uh-oh, oh, I forgot to put that in there. Um, we have, uh, uh, the reason I'm here today is because I fund fundamentally believe in the power of entrepreneurship. Right? I fundamentally believe that if you want to make the world a better place, you unleash armies of entrepreneurs because that's exactly what they do. Our job in this room is to help them do that. Okay, so the reason I had that other picture is part of what we did was we tested our theory that the way you wrap business and people and finance and support and mentors around entrepreneurs, that that model is good for solving all kinds of problems in the world. So I was just going to say that we took that after our tech experience and we applied that, as Martin said, I started an entertainment company where we're making movies and music, but we took our theories of good entrepreneurship and a strong ecosystem supporting it to see what it could do and we uh, launched a music company from scratch doing that and uh, this picture uh, was earlier this year, uh, we actually won a Grammy. Uh, that's me on the Grammy red carpet right after we won, taking a picture of all the people taking a picture of me because I thought it was so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I, I gotta tell you a funny thing as well though, because you know, coming from this region uh, and being a software engineer, somebody in the paparazzi yelled, Mr. Hoffman, how does it feel? And I said, this is the dream of software engineers everywhere. <laughs> Seriously? Um, but it, it kind of proved our general theory that these good business practices are the way to solve problems everywhere in the world. So that being said, after eight startups, um, I had made a commitment to giving back. Uh, and so to actually live that commitment, the last three years, I've been kind of a world tour of mentorship. I said I would give back by mentoring entrepreneurs anywhere and everywhere. But in the process of doing that, I kind of turned it into a world tour. And I've been traveling uh, country by country. I think when we were looking at our film footage, over five years now, we've worked with entrepreneurs in 100 different countries. So here's the interesting part. It's really educational to do that. I'm supposed to be teaching, but every day I'm learning. Whether it's Russia or whether I was sitting on the dirt just days ago in Morocco and North Africa under the sun with a bunch of entrepreneurs and saying, wow, that's an amazing idea. Where'd you guys think that up? So learning about ecosystems and learning best practices is exactly what you guys are doing here, right? And I've been doing that for a while. We even had a crazy idea. And just before this, we were all having a discussion about crazy ideas um, because sometimes the craziest ideas are the ones that, that wind up being the big ones. But one of our crazy ideas was to test this theory that I just told you about if you want to make the world a better place, prepare, educate, support, and unleash armies of entrepreneurs. So we did a grand experiment two summers ago. We decided to take entrepreneurs from all over the world, mostly young people, take them on a ship, sail around the world, see all the world's problems firsthand and see what they would do about it. That is the actual ship. Uh, we actually did this. We had entrepreneurs all over the world submit videos why they should be on that ship. We took entrepreneurs, sailed around, got off in countries to see how the rest of the world lives. You guys, don't forget, we got it really good here in upstate New York. This is a nice place to live. The whole rest of the world doesn't have that advantage. So we took entrepreneurs from here and elsewhere, 
and said, here's the world's problems, what will you do about them? And uh, it's a story for a different day, but unbelievable numbers of startups were created right on board that ship and in these countries, proving the fact that when you give entrepreneurs a chance, especially this whole next generation of them, they will fix things. They will make things better. So that being said, why are we here today? We're here today because entrepreneurs solve problems. People always tell me, when, when I was, uh, and Martin, thanks for making me feel old by pointing out that I got in computers before they existed, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, I didn't write the first line of code, but I've been around for a while. Um, the, uh, people used to say to me all the time, uh, why can't you just get, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get a job like everyone else, right? Because everyone had a job at some company, and I was always off doing something, right? Well, you know what I was doing? I was solving problems. Every time I saw a problem, I said, I think I can fix that. And so people kept saying, why can't you get a job like everyone else? What's wrong with you? I had a job. I didn't even know the word entrepreneur. I, can't, I still can't even spell the word. I don't know who came up with a long, fancy French word with a bunch of vowels for the world's simplest job. But my business card would have said problem solver, because that's what entrepreneurs do. In order to solve problems, it turns out that we create infrastructure around us. It turns out that creates jobs. And that creates innovations that sometimes bigger companies, not that they don't innovate, but you know, when people talk about things like lean startups, we have no choice. We're broke. Of course we're lean, right? We can't fix this a big, slow, expensive way or we die. We don't eat. So by definition, we're lean, we're efficient, and we're innovative because it's survival for entrepreneurs and we solve problems. That's why we need more of them. Um, that's what entrepreneurs do. One of the things that I want to say, by the way, the key, a lot of times I'm not going to get into this much today in the interest of time, but you know, I, I, I just emphasize for entrepreneurs in the room and for those of you supporting them, the first question you should ask is, are we solving a real problem? And I'm just going to, for, as an illustration, tell you my first startup quickly. I was 20 something years old. I was in line at an airport. I was waiting to get to check in. I took one hour, when I got to the end of the line, I handed the lady my ID and she pushed one button, print, and handed me a boarding pass. I said, seriously, you made me stand here for an hour so you could print something? She said, you can't get on a plane without a boarding pass. I said, I get that, but it's a printout. And she said, right, but you still need it to get on the plane. I said, but it took an hour to get a printout. Put the printer over there and I'll do it. And she said, you can't do that, right? So I will tell you what my first startup is the next day, pretty much. We designed, patented, and started selling in airports all over the world those kiosks that you get your boarding pass out of today. Um, we saw a problem. <laughs> Some, sometimes people will still text me, say, hey, thanks, man. I just ran to the airport. Um, we saw a problem. We solved a problem. It was a problem that a lot of people had. It was a problem that people were willing to pay money for. By the way, on the way out of the airport, I was asking business people, if I, if, would you give me five bucks if I would hand you your boarding pass right now and you could skip the line? And people were yelling, 10, 20. And I was like, I have a business here, okay? <laughs> so solving a problem that someone cares about that somebody would pay money for, it ain't that hard. So here's what I'm gonna say for you guys to do. What I'd do if I was in this region, you may already be doing this, but why doesn't somebody make a list of all the problems that you have in your area and challenge entrepreneurs? Call it the whatever challenge it is. By the way, I did this in Cairo after sitting for 1,400 hours in the 18 million cars that are in Cairo traffic. I went to a bunch of entrepreneurs and I said, there's got to be a better way, fix this. So there is an app now that a group of young Egyptian entrepreneurs created. It's a social media traffic app where people are tweeting what's in front of them and what intersection to avoid and where an accident just happened. It aggregates the information and it routes traffic around Cairo now and millions of people use it. It was created because we said someone fix this problem. So we should make a list of things that need addressing here. It works for both of us. We make upstate New York a better place to live and we give entrepreneurs something to actually focus on that creates value in the community and somebody will pay them to do. Um, actively engage this ecosystem, we are. Okay, I, I had written that before, we already are, but everybody knows this. If we don't engage our entrepreneurs, they'll leave. I can't tell you how many calls I get. I, I do a lot of mentoring now, including entrepreneurs from right here that say to me, do I need to move to California? Should I move to the New York, Boston area? Should I go to London, whatever? The answer is absolutely no. Everything you need is not only in this region, it's in this room today. But if we don't engage them and tell them that and give them mentorship and educate them about financing and provide all these opportunities about the problems, the relationships that we have, they'll leave, right? So, so we have to engage the ecosystem. It's our job to go engage entrepreneurs and make sure that we are wrapping a blanket of ecosystem and support around them. Um, we're bringing the community together. One of the things that Silicon Valley did best, we don't need to go there. In fact, 
I've never lived a day in, of my life there. I was particularly proud one day when they were talking about internet companies and at an event that I was at, and they were saying all the biggest internet companies came from Silicon Valley. We built Priceline in the tri-state area. We've never set foot in Silicon Valley, and it was one of the largest internet co companies in the world. I was proud of the fact that we did that in the Northeast. You don't need to be in Silicon Valley, but it doesn't hurt to pay attention to the stuff they do right. One of the things they do really well there is the socialization of business, right? So we need to do more and more of that. Meetups, it's not all formal things, it's not all conferences, although this is excellent that you're all here today, but it's meetups, it's hackathons, it's social events. I put tailgates on there, okay? And I'll tell you why. The goal is to, oh, hang on. I'm gonna go forward and then back. The goal is to do this, create, and I, this isn't a real term, create kinetic collisions. Kinetic collisions are what happened when you put high energy, smart, people that want to make a difference in the room together when they've never met each other. Amazing things happen. It's funny because we're in a high-tech, mobile, text each other world, but you know where magic happens? Magic happens when the kinetic collisions happen. Those happen when we're physically in the same place. It can be around a beer. Some of the best ideas I've ever heard were having pizza and beer and just hanging out with people that don't know each other. So I'm going to tell everyone in this room, you are doing yourself a disservice if you leave this room without introducing yourself to at least one person you did not know when you walked into this room. You might just be missing the person that make all the difference in your life, in your startup, in your funding, in your team, in your customer base, whatever it is. Create collisions by getting out, meeting people, and creating that social environment where people from all over this region are in the same room. I can't tell you how many events I go to where it's an angel investor event and it's all angel investors. Then I go out to the, to the pub with the entrepreneurs that are all having a beer, it's all entrepreneurs. And I keep thinking, why are we not all in one room? because the magic doesn't happen when we're all in our part of town, but it happens too frequently. You gotta mix out of your comfort zone with people who don't dress like you. I can't believe I'm even wearing a coat today, but I did that out of respect for you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, and, and start to create those opportunities. So this was the other, the, the slide that I skipped over here. This is the other thing that just amazes me. We gotta stop focusing, and it was great that we were just talking about that before this lunch. Stop focusing on launching companies and launch more entrepreneurs. Here's what happens frequently. And, and I look at some of the people, we need the investors, right, to see the ecosystem. I only wish these people would learn to read human beings the way they read spreadsheets. They'll spend three hours with a spreadsheet, decide they don't like it, and spend five minutes telling the entrepreneur, next, we're not interested, right? The time should be spent launching entrepreneurs because their first idea that they just gave you may in fact fail, statistically it will, but they won't. So if you throw out the baby with the bathwater, we just discouraged and discarded the girl that's gonna start the next great startup because we didn't like this one. Talent, money is not, people say, what do entrepreneurs need most? And people always say funding, no, no, no. Uh, that's not the scarcest resource talent is. And talent on both sides. Talented entrepreneurs and talented mentors, right? It's all about human capital. So the more mentorship we have, the more talented people in this room that say, well, I never was an entrepreneur. No, but you're a successful human being. And you have a lot to add to an entrepreneur even if you've never done a startup. And for entrepreneurs, we have to recognize that this might not be the great idea, but we're not looking for spreadsheets, we're looking for DNA. We're looking for the DNA of success. And when you see that, that's when you say, I don't like your idea, but I really like you, and I'm gonna help you because you're gonna launch five other companies that are gonna be huge. That's what we have to do. We gotta read people the way we read spreadsheets. We gotta find talent and nurture it right here in upstate New York and make sure they know we're there for them and make sure they don't leave. That's where these things happen. And, and you know, I think part of that is recognizing, and I know this is hard for investors. You invested to make money, okay? In, in many, and that's not true of all people, but in many cases, the reason you're doing the investment is to make money. But if all, for the entrepreneurs especially, the focus, the drive, I've been very blessed to meet a lot of interesting people and spend time with them along the way, and I try to listen to everybody that's had success. Recently, I spent time with people like, you know, working on something that I'm doing with Richard Branson, a tech challenge, time that I spent uh, with Jack Welch from GE doing an event like this, time that I spent with, you know, a lot of different people uh, that have achieved their success, but in every time, Steve Woon recently told me how he built Las Vegas. Every success story, there's something to learn, but I want to tell you the most important lesson. Not one of those stories starts with, I was just hoping to make some money. The most successful people in the world, it was about self-determination. There was a legacy. Wouldn't you like to look back on upstate New York and say, this is what it looks like after I lived here? This is what I contributed to this ecosystem, to this area? You can't do that with just, with just money. You gotta do that with passion and focus and purpose and drive 
So entrepreneurs, the best ones, won't tell you, I'm just hoping to get rich. They'll tell you, I want to fix this problem. I want to change the world in this way. I want to make this part of upstate New York completely different than it was when I was born here. Those are what we're looking for, recognizing that entrepreneurship is driven by self-determination and passion, not by spreadsheets, is what the best ecosystems look like. So let's make sure we don't lose sight of that fact. Um, the world has changed dramatically. We all, we all talk about this uh, quite a bit, that uh, whether we're talking about the impact of technology, the different attitudes of millennials, of the next generation of entrepreneurs, etc. cetera, I gotta tell you a quick, Tony, what's my time? Because I've, I've told my whole speech in one giant paragraph with no punctuation so far. I eliminated the punctuation to save time. I'm at what? Crap, I went way too fast. I'm going to start over. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I was so stressed about the time that I went way too fast on this. So I'm actually going to stop and tell you a story about sort of this generation, which, which part of what people ask me traveling around, and I've been sponsoring, I've been supporting uh, entrepreneurship uh, for the White House, uh, the State Department, the United Nations. So through those entities, I've gotten a chance to uh, head to a lot of different places uh, all over the world and meet with entrepreneurs to look for best practices. And by the way, one of the things we all naively believe is we must be smarter here in the United States because look at all the great companies that come out of here. And the lesson I'm about to show you in these next couple of slides is we were never smarter. We just had tools. Their ideas were always as good, but they had no resources to build anything. And I'm going to show you an actual, uh, an example of that in a minute coming up. But there's some really good news. When we took this ship and we took 20-somethings and sailed around the world and went out, I'll tell you one of the stories. We went out uh, into rural India uh, and we said, you want to see a hospital? It was a tent tied to a tree with some cots. And they said, where's the hospital? And the Indian doctor said, this is the hospital. And they said, where's the operating room? And he said, uh, it's like that cot under that tree. There's no operating room. I mean, where's the equipment? We can't sterilize anything. What's going on? Now, a horrible thing happened while we were standing there, which we weren't really anticipating. A woman that was lying on a cot that we had been talking to briefly, waiting for treatment in a long line, uh, they walked by and they pulled the sheet up over her. And somebody said, she can't breathe if you put the sheet over her head. And he said, sorry, she just died. And we weren't trying to expose these people to this. But the kids were really upset. What do you mean she just died? And he said, I couldn't do anything. And they said, what did she have? So we started going through the list. And people in front of us were dying of things they would never die from in, in this country. right? And we were trying to expose them to the way the rest of the world lives. But here's the amazing part of this generation. You know what they did? We got back on that ship that I showed you. The whole fifth floor of that ship was a lab, like a startup lab. They were working round the clock on that lab and then sending out sheets. And we, next time we get to port, Next time the ship pulls in land, go buy these things. When they were done, they designed and created an endoscopic surgical device using off-the-shelf parts that these people built. In minutes, this thing was able to save hundreds of lives. But here's the best part of the story. I sat down with them and said, this is a business. You've created a device that can save lives in parts of the world where they can't do any surgery, where they can't cut people open. And there were five conditions that people were dying of that this device could actually be used to fix, to save lives with. So I sat down with them, with a group of young entrepreneurs. We were talking about it, and they were showing me emails. Well, guess what they did? I was talking about intellectual property and patents. They were sending the design to people all over the world, crowdsourcing it. I said, I can't, what are you doing? We can't file a patent out. You gave everyone in the world your intellectual property, your design. Then I found out that they were telling people, if you build one, you can use it free in your area. I said, guys, you just killed the licensing model. There's no revenue now because you told everyone they could have it free. Then I sat and I looked into the eyes, especially the young man who was the designer, and a huge realization happened. I said, oh my God, you were never planning to sell this. That was foreign to my generation. He said, no, Jeff, all we're trying to do is save life. I said, you could make millions on this. And he said, or we could save millions of lives. Right? It never occurred to this group that they could get rich doing this. What it occurred to them was if they crowdsourced the design and people agreed to share their improvements and send it all over the world, that rural clinics without medical facilities everywhere in the world could start saving lives right away. It's pretty encouraging with all the world's problems to see a generation of young entrepreneurs that say, we'll fix it. We don't like, they're telling us, we don't like what you're leaving with us with, but we'll fix it. And I'll, I'll add one more thing. I recently... Uh, was invited to speak in Israel, and I went to see why Israel was a startup nation, why they create so many, so much tech, and, and probably the most interesting
conversation I had there was I spent uh, an afternoon with Shimon Prez, the Israeli president. And I'm like, what am I doing? So that was like the red carpet. What am I doing here? I have a lot of what am I doing here moments. Um, I was sitting there thinking I'm sitting with Shimon Perez, the Israeli president. What are you supposed to say? So half sarcastically or jokingly, the question was, so what's the key to Middle East peace? Except he answered it really seriously. He said entrepreneurship. And I just froze. I said, wait, say that again. And he said, if we taught everyone in the world how to help themselves and everyone had a, had a better life, they would have something to lose and they'd stop killing each other. He said, the reason when you've got, he was talking about the other side, when you've got an Arab population that's unemployed, nothing to lose, baking in the sun and just having a bad life, no wonder conflict starts. He said, imagine all those people with viable businesses, good jobs, nice houses, their kids are in college, and someone says, hey, let's blow up the neighborhood. He said, they're going to say, you know what? I'm doing fine right now. Leave me out of this. Entrepreneurship, I believe, is the new, it's the new currency, right? It's the new diplomacy. It's the way to make the world a better place. So let me close with, and I'll have some time for Q&A, uh, a story of this. And this story is no different whether we're in Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, or wherever. But it's the fact that entrepreneur, entrepreneurship has never had a brighter future and a better moment than right now. So I made this my commitment. I mentioned to you guys to giving back. And in 2012, I was doing this big social experiment. And my experiment was, I'm... Uh, again, giving back has to hurt. If you only do it when it's convenient, there's no good football game on, that's not really giving back, okay? Giving back is, is so I, I was trying to honor my own commitment. So here's what I said in 2012. I am going to spend a year, and during this year, I'm going to try not to say no to anybody that asks me for help and just see how this goes. I don't know where I'll be on any day. I won't do any work work, but it turns out I had nothing short of the best year of my entire life. No IPOs, no transactions, no money made, and a year of my life that made the whole rest of my life worth living for doing that. So in that vein, one day, and by the way, that one year, I said, that's when I said, I'll turn this into a world tour, looking at the globe on my desk. Well, it turns out the world's a lot bigger than the globe on my desk. They should have a thing that says countries in mirror are larger than they, whatever that thing is. <laughs> uh, it took me three years. So I just finished that. Um, and you're kind of winding up here at this spot with you guys today, this world tour. But I get an email. And it's from Senegal. That's what this picture is. Um, and it's from a young man. The email starts out saying, I know you'll probably never read this. And if you do, I'm sure you won't respond. So right away, I knew I was going to read it and respond. Uh, from a 19-year-old man in Senegal. So the coolest thing, which if I had video I would show you, was I arrived in that village in Senegal. Uh, and I am standing there in this village uh, thinking, what on earth am I doing here? And the kid comes around. In that part of West Africa, if they don't create food, they don't eat. So they're out working the fields in agriculture. And the kid comes around the corner and keeps rubbing his eyes and says, okay, I, this isn't real. And he said, what are you doing here? Because he recognized me. I said, wait, time out. You invited me. I hope you didn't misunderstand that. This is a long flight to find out you didn't mean it. Um, and he said, no, I invited you. Let's sit down. So he took a shower. And look how they live in huts made out of mud uh, with grass. In fact, it was grass roofs, no floor, just dirt. What's funny is this young man said, can I get you something to drink? And I said, just water. And he said, OK, you just grab a bucket and an ox and go down the hill. And I said, why would you offer me water if you don't have it? And he said, just making a point, um, which I thought was kind of interesting about the way they live. So uh, I am sitting there, and he says, Mr. Hoffman, let me tell you my idea. So he starts talking about his startup. Okay, And I have to tell you something, guys. I all of a sudden closed my eyes, and I was thinking, I had, by the way, I had just given a speech on the camp at, at Stanford and visited Google and Pinterest and other companies, but I had just given a speech on the Stanford campus. Now I'm sitting in that moment in that place in West Africa, and I closed my eyes and I thought, if you took away the accent and the dirt floor, and actually I secretly was thirsty, um, and you see that goat in the picture of the goat that was trying to tear my pants off. And they were saying, please don't touch the goat. That's our food source. And I said, well, this is my pants source, and I kind of need these too. Um, if you took the goat and, the, and everything else out of that picture, I could have been on Stanford campus. The kid's idea was brilliant. The kid was brilliant. So I stopped, and I said, time out. I said, where on earth did you learn this stuff? Where did you come up with this in the middle of nowhere, literally? And he said, oh, Jeff, Stanford classes. I take Stanford and MIT. I said, well, that's not fair. I said, you told me you've never left this country. He said, I have never left the country. I said, I'm confused. He said, Jeff, I want a better life, and a better life for my neighborhood and my country. So I work in the fields all day, but all night I go to the internet cafe, he said, and I take free courses on Coursera. 
right? That didn't exist not that long ago. He takes free university classes. So he starts, he continues with the presentation. And when he's continuing with the presentation, I said to him, uh, I was listening again, and I said, okay, the words you just used, you didn't learn those from an academic. Those are not Stanford class words. Those are practical application words. How on earth did you even know to say those things, right? And he said to me, oh, easy. He said, after I take Coursera classes, I go listen to TED Talks in the middle of the night. And there's a domain expert on anything you want to learn. It's probably the best person in the world on it, on TED. He said, Mr. Hoffman, that's why you're here. I watched your TED Talk, sent you an email, and here you are. That didn't even exist not long ago. He said, let me show you my presentation. And he took out his old, dirty piece of crap laptop, right? Right away, what am I thinking? We need to get these people equipment. We need to get them mentorship. We need to get them an office. But I'll tell you what, he still shows me the PowerPoint. I said, busted, you didn't make this PowerPoint, no way. He said, I did. I said, you don't even know those terms. He said, no, I don't. So when I'm done with the TED Talks, he said, I go on SlideShare, and I found the 10 best investor presentations in the world as uploaded to SlideShare, and I learned from them and created this. Here's the punchline. 19-year-old kid today, we built an infrastructure, an ecosystem around him. He has 350 employees in seven African nations today. He has made a huge impact in the world. People with ideas are everywhere. They always had ideas as good as ours. They're all over the, if he can do it, then you certainly can't tell me somebody that lives and all the benefits of upstate New York needs to move to Silicon Valley. You kidding? That kid didn't, right? We got investment from major companies now. Good ideas exist everywhere. It's just that, well, I'll tell you a sign I have in my office and then I'll stop. It says, ideas are welcome, execution is worshiped. Everybody has an idea. The ability, our success was because we were able to execute. Executing takes a village. Executing takes mentorship, it takes financing, it takes customers, it takes relationships, it takes everyone in this room to point at one entrepreneur and say, we're going to help her execute until she has 350 employees in seven countries. So I commend you guys on the effort that's already going on in this region. I hope that everybody will re realize that uh, there is no they. They aren't going to do this. It's you. Okay, they aren't going to go help her. It's you. If you're sitting in this room thinking, I hope somebody does something, it ain't going to happen. It happens when you realize that you are the somebody and you do it. So again, I commend you on having this award ceremony, on having this event, and on recognizing that the key to the, to the brightest future of upstate New York is unleashing your own army of entrepreneurs. Thank you very much for having me today.